This module begins with a deeper exploration of the different anatomical systems within the human body, beginning with the skeletal system. Once completed with this module, you should be able to describe the anatomy and physiology of the skeletal system. The skeletal system serves several critical functions within the human body. The first and arguably most obvious function served by the skeletal system is that it serves as the framework for the body itself. Bones define the overall structure and appearance of the human body, and all other tissues and organs within the body are anchored to or work within the structure provided by the body's skeleton. When combined with the body's muscles, the skeletal system provides the rigid leverage, bones, and fulcrums, joints, necessary for movement. The bones within the skeletal system also protect the internal organs from harm due to trauma and external forces. The brain, for example, is protected by the bones that comprise the skull. The internal organs of the chest, including the lungs, heart, stomach, liver, and others, sit comfortably within the ribcage, which shields those vital organs from external trauma. Beyond those functions, the bones, or more specifically bone tissue, serve as a reservoir for critical minerals like calcium and phosphorus. Yellow bone marrow contains adipose tissue, more commonly referred to as lipids or fat, which has triglycerides that can be released to serve as a source of energy for the body. Red bone marrow is responsible for the production of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. When a person thinks of the skeletal system, the first thing that probably comes to mind are bones. Unlike other tissues in the body, osseous tissue, bone tissue, is hard and rigid. It is this tissue that forms the bones, which are then subsequently classified based upon their shape. The first type of bones within the skeletal system are long bones, which are, as they sound, long in length when compared to other bones or their own width. Such long bones include those in the arms, the humerus, ulna, and radius, and the legs, the femur, tibia, and fibula. These bones are recognized to have two main regions, the diaphysis and the epiphysis. The diaphysis is a long, hollow tube of the bone that runs between the wider and broader ends of the bone. The inside of this hollow bone tube is referred to as the medullary cavity, or more simply, the marrow canal. This canal is lined with a thin membrane called the endosteum, which is a thin vascular membrane of connective tissue that helps with the forming and repairing of bone. Within the medullary cavity is yellow bone marrow. The epiphysis portion of the bone is the wider region located at both ends of the long bone. The inside of this region of bone is filled with spongy, cancellous bone, which is a very porous and highly vascularized type of osseous tissue. This spongy bone tissue is softer and weaker than compact bone tissue, which is denser, stronger, and seen on the exterior surface of long bones. In many long bones, this spongy bone within the epiphysis is filled with red bone marrow. On the exterior of the epiphysis is a thin, slippery layer of articular cartilage which helps absorb shock and reduce friction between bones that meet at a joint. Short bones are, in comparison to long bones, significantly shorter in length. When evaluated individually, short bones are often only marginally longer than they are wide. These bones are found only in the wrists and feet and include the phalanges, the bones that make up the fingers and toes, the metacarpals in the hands, and the metatarsals in the feet. Flat bones are designed predominantly for protection of internal organs and include the sternum, ribs, scapula, and portions of the skull. Despite the word flat being the name for these types of bones, they are often curved in shape. These bones consist of spongy bone, referred to as diplo, encased within compact bones on both sides, like a sandwich. This structure provides a margin of safety, so to speak, in that if the exterior portion of the bone breaks, the interior spongy bone can absorb some force and, hopefully, the interior compact bone adjacent to the organ it is protecting remains intact. Irregular bones do not easily fit into the previous categories in that they have unique shapes that tend to support specialized functions. Examples of irregular bones include those of the face and sinuses, the mandible, the jaw, the pelvic girdle, and the spinal cord.
Another important anatomical feature of bones is that most of them are covered with a dual layer of dense fibrous membrane connective tissue called the periosteum. Areas of bones covered with articular cartilage do not have periosteum tissue in those particular areas. This tissue contains numerous blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves. Without the periosteum and its blood supply, the bone would die, similar to what happens in a myocardial infarct or stroke when the blood supply to the heart or brain is impeded or stopped. In evaluating how bone is actually produced during fetal development to form a complete human skeleton, the first thing to recognize is that bone develops in two specific ways, through intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification. Ossification is the name of the process by which bone replaces other tissues through the depositing of calcium salts. Ossification leads to osteogenesis, the formation of bone. Intramembranous bones develop between flat sheet-like layers of connective tissue. Unlike endochondral ossification, intramembranous ossification does not involve cartilage. In this process, osteoblasts, the cells responsible for the creation of bone, deposit bone collagen and other proteins to create a bony matrix around them. The periosteum is formed and bone growth continues. The skull is an example of a bone that is created through intramembranous ossification. Within newborns and infants, areas between the flat bones of the skull are comprised of tough connective tissues called fontanelles, or, to the layperson, soft spots. Over time, the fontanelles are replaced with the bones of the skull, which then fuse together to form a single bony unit. Endochondral bones are formed upon hyaline cartilage in a shape that is similar to that of the bone it will become. Common for long bone formation, endochondral ossification occurs when osteoblasts secrete osteoid against the shaft of the hyaline cartilage. This osteoid is an unmineralized organic tissue that hardens as inorganic salts are deposited into it, forming hard, mineralized bone. This process begins at the center of the new bone and works its way outward to the ends of the bone. Eventually, the process results in the creation of the marrow canal within the center of the bone and spongy bone at the ends, encapsulated within compact bone. One component of long bones that we did not discuss in the previous slide is that of epiphyseal discs or plates. Epiphyseal discs or plates, also referred to as growth plates, are layers of hyaline cartilage and long bone between the epiphysis and the diaphysis where bone growth occurs, typically through adolescence. As bone is created and osteoblasts become trapped in the bone matrix that they created, many become osteocytes, which are specialized bone cells that move nutrients and waste through the matrix of the form bone. Another important bone cell is the osteoclast which will actually break down bone tissue through the release of enzymes that dissolve minerals in the bone, releasing calcium and phosphate into the bloodstream. These cells work in concert with osteoblasts to maintain normal remodeling of bone, which is the removal of old bone with the creation of new bone over the course of a person's lifetime. This process helps regulate calcium homeostasis in the body, repair micro damage to bones that occur due to normal everyday stress, and to shape the skeleton during growth. The growth and maintenance of bones within the body are also significantly impacted by several factors such as heredity, nutrition, hormones, and exercise, or stress. Some research has suggested that bone strength and bone mineral density, in addition to certain bone impacting diseases such as osteoporosis, may be impacted by underlying inherited traits. Proper nutrition plays a significant role in the development and maintenance of bone throughout a person's life. According to American Bone Health, which is an organization dedicated to teaching people how to build and keep strong and healthy bones for life to prevent bone loss, osteoporosis, and fractures, if a person does not have enough calcium, the body will take the calcium that it needs from the bones, thus weakening the bones. Calcium is also required to make calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate, which form hydroxyapatite crystals that give bone its hardness. Vitamin D is necessary for calcium to be absorbed in the intestine. Magnesium allows for proper calcium and vitamin D regulation in the body while also serving as part of the structural component of bone. 
Phosphorus is part of the bone mineral itself and is also important for neutralizing acidic foods that could otherwise be harmful to bone tissue. Some potassium salts also work to neutralize harmful acids that come from the body's metabolic processes. Vitamin A influences osteoblast and osteoclasts. Zinc mineralizes bone and stabilizes receptor proteins for vitamin D synthesis. Vitamin B12 has an impact on bone building cells. Vitamin C is essential for collagen formation and it also increases absorption of plant-based iron. Fluoride is a structural component of bone. Having low levels of vitamin K in the body has been correlated to lower bone density and increased risk of bone fractures. Omega-3 fatty acids play a part in reducing inflammation that may interfere with osteoblast function. Beyond minerals and vitamins associated with eating well and maintaining proper nutrition, the body's endocrine system also produces hormones that play a part in controlling bone growth and maintaining the bone matrix. We will discuss hormones involved in bone growth and maintenance in just a bit. Additionally, while too much sudden or significant stress on a bone can lead to a break, routine mechanical stress on bones through movement and exercise is actually a good thing for bones. A lack of mechanical stress on bones results in the loss of mineral salts and collagen fibers within bone, thus reducing strength. Inversely, healthy mechanical stress stimulates the deposition of mineral salts and collagen fibers within the bone, ultimately increasing the strength of the bone. Bones are adaptive, and studies have shown that people who exercise regularly have thicker and stronger bones than their sedentary counterparts. As further evidence, astronauts on long space missions can lose approximately 1-2% to of their bone mass per month given the lack of gravity and routine mechanical stresses associated with motion within Earth's gravitational pull. When identifying hormones produced by the body that are integral to bone growth and maintenance, there are several that must be mentioned. Growth hormone produced within the pituitary gland stimulates chondrocyte proliferation in the epiphyseal plates, which increases the length of long bones while also increasing calcium retention that enhances mineralization and stimulates osteoblastic activity, which improves bone density. Osteoblastic activity and synthesis of bone matrix is also influenced by thyroxine, produced by the thyroid gland, and the sex hormones estrogen in girls and testosterone in boys. The influence of estrogen and testosterone in adolescents is what drives growth spurts within that age group, and they also promote the conversion of cartilage within the epiphyseal plate to its bony remnant, called the epiphyseal line, which then stops additional growth in the long bones. The kidneys also produce an active form of vitamin D, known as calcitrol, which stimulates the absorption of calcium and phosphate from the digestive tract. Parathyroid hormone stimulates osteoclast proliferation and bone reabsorption activity, while calcitonin inhibits osteoclast activity and stimulates calcium uptake by bones. Lastly, while we often think about insulin as critical for helping the body utilize carbohydrates, sugar, insulin is also recognized as an anabolic agent in bone that can preserve and increase bone density and strength. With that background information in mind, we will now delve into the structure of the skeletal system, looking more specifically at different regions of the body and the bones within those particular areas. To begin, the skeletal system is divided into two main regions, the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton consists of those bones on the vertical axis or center of the body, which includes the bones of the skull and face, the chest and back, and the vertebral column. The appendicular skeleton includes bones that would be considered related to the body's appendages. These bones therefore include those within the shoulders, arms, hands, pelvic girdle, legs, and feet. We will begin by looking at the axial skeleton. Sitting at the top of the axial skeleton is the skull. The skull consists of 28 bones divided into three primary areas, the cranium, the face, and the auditory ossicles. The cranium consists of a collection of eight bones fused together to form what is known as a cranial vault. 
At the front of the skull sits the frontal bone, which forms the forehead and also serves as the top of the eyeball sockets. Directly behind the frontal bone to the top of the skull sits two parietal bones, one for each side of the head. Directly underneath the parietal bones are the temporal bones, which encase the sides and the lateral base of the skull. Toward the rear of the head is the occipital bone. The occipital bone forms the back and base of the skull. There is a hole in the base of the occipital bone called the foramen magnum through which the spinal cord passes. From here toward the front of the skull is the sphenoid bone, which sits between the frontal, occipital, and ethmoid bones to form the frontal base of the skull. The ethmoid bone, as just mentioned, sits between the eye sockets, providing structure for the orbits and the nasal cavity. The areas where the bones of the skull join are called sutures. In newborns and infants, the bones of the skull are not yet fused and fibrous tissues, called fontanelles, bridge the gap between the bones. Over time, these fontanelles close and by about two years of age, the bones in the skull should have fused into sutures, eliminating the fontanelles. There are 14 separate bones that make up the face. These bones not only provide the structure for the face and its soft tissues, but they also serve as protection for the eyes, nose, and upper airway and digestive tract, while also providing a mechanism for the chewing of food. The first facial bone we will identify is the mandible. The mandible, also known as the lower jaw, is the only freely moving bone in the skull. The rear of the mandible connects to the temporal bones on both sides of the face to form the temporal mandibular joint. While we will discuss various joints a little later within this presentation, the temporal mandibular joint is known as a condyloid joint consisting of an ovoid articular surface that pairs with an elliptical cavity. This type of joint allows the jaw to move in two planes along two axes, providing for flexion, extension, adduction, abduction, and circumduction. Essentially, the jaw can not only pivot open and close given the structure of this joint, but it can also move within a limited range forward, back, and side to side. Above the mandible is the maxillae, which actually consists of two bones, the left and right maxilla. Behind the maxillae are two paired palatine bones, which, when combined with the maxillae, comprise what is referred to as the hard palate. The maxilla extend up to the lateral side of the nasal cavity and the interior of the orbits and join up with two lacrimal bones, one on each side, at the interior or medial wall of the orbital cavity. Crying is also called lacrimation, based upon the name of the lacrimal bones. Two nasal bones are fused together and are seated between the upper aspect of the maxillae to provide the structure for the bridge of the nose. There are also two nasal concha bones on the lateral aspect of the nasal cavity along with the vulmar bone that runs from the back of the nasal cavity forming the bony part of the nasal septum up to the palatine bones. Two zygomatic bones, one on each side, provide structure for the cheeks. Within these various bones of the face are hollow air-filled cavities that comprise the paranasal sinuses. These hollow regions help to reduce the weight of the skull, provide resonance for the voice, and allow for drainage of fluids into the nasal cavity. The name of the four paranasal sinuses correlate with the surrounding bones. The frontal sinuses are within the frontal bone. The ethmoid sinuses are within the ethmoid bone. The sphenoidal sinuses are within the body of the sphenoid bone, and the maxillary sinuses, the largest sinuses of the group, are within the right and left maxillae. Epithelial tissue lines the sinuses, and the tissue contains cilia, which are small little hairs that move back and forth to move particulates out of the body, thus the name ciliated epithelium. The epithelium has cells that secrete mucus onto the cilia, which traps airborne particles that enter the upper airway through the nose. These cilia move in a concerted pattern toward the anterior part of the nasal cavity, where the mucus can be removed by blowing one's nose, or the mucus is routed down the throat, where it is processed by the digestive system. The last six bones in the skull are part of the inner ear. The malleus, hammer, Incus, anvil, and stapes, stirrup, are present in each ear to transfer the vibration of the tympanic membrane or eardrum caused by sound waves that enter the ear to the cochlea 
which produces nerve impulses that are interpreted by the brain as sounds. At the bottom of the skull's temporal bone is a bony protrusion known as the mastoid process. The location of this particular bony feature is behind, or to the rear of, the ear. In addition to serving as a structure to which numerous head muscles attach, similar to the paranasal sinuses discussed on the previous slide, the mastoid process contains air-filled spaces referred to as mastoid air cells or mastoid sinuses. Moving down from or inferior to the skull, the axial skeleton continues into the vertebral column. By virtue of its very name, it should not be surprising that the vertebral column is comprised of vertebrae. There are 33 vertebrae that form the spinal column. Starting at the top and working our way down, there are 7 vertebrae in the cervical spine, or neck. There are 12 vertebrae in the thoracic spine, 5 vertebrae in the lumbar spine, 5 vertebrae in the sacrum, which in adults are fused together to form the sacrum, and an additional four cochleageal vertebrae at the bottom of the spinal column that are fused together in adults to form the coccyx. As you may have noticed, the spinal column has several anterior and posterior curves to it that add strength, aid in balance, and assist in preventing injury. As you progress down through the spinal column, the vertebrae increase in relative size to support the weight of the other vertebrae and the structures above it. Each vertebrae is named based upon the region in which it sits and its relative location within that region. The cervical vertebrae, for example, are named C1 through C7. Thoracic vertebrae are named T1 through T12, and the lumbar vertebrae are numbered L1 through L5. As the remaining vertebrae are fused in the sacral and coccygeal areas, those fused structures are simply referred to as the sacrum and coccyx, respectively. Laterally on the sacrum is an area that joins with the iliac crests of the pelvic girdle to form the sacroiliac joints, often abbreviated as SI joints. In evaluating the structure of individual vertebrae with more detail, the anterior portion of the vertebrae is called the vertebral body. This is the portion of the vertebrae that provides weight-bearing strength. On the other side of the vertebrae, the posterior, is a vertebral arch, bony arch, or posterior arch, depending upon the resource you are referencing, which consists of the spinal process and the two transverse processes, one on each side. These structures serve as connection points for muscles and ligaments. The body and vertebral arch is connected by an area of bone known as the pedicle. The pedicle on either side connects to the lamina, which is the bony area between the transverse process on either side and the spinous process. In between the body and vertebral arch is a hollow cavity that accommodates the spinal cord, spinal nerve roots, meninges, and numerous blood vessels. Gaps or holes formed between these structures when assembled into a complete spinal column allow for nerves and blood vessels to exit the vertebral foramen to other areas of the body. Located between the individual vertebrae are intervertebral discs. These discs are made up of an exterior portion called the annulus fibrous and an interior nucleus called the nucleus pulposus. Comprised of water and sturdy elastic collagen fibers, the annulus fibrosus assists with the rotational stability of the spine while also helping sustain and tolerate compressive stresses within the spine. The nucleus pulposus contains water, collagen, and protoglycans similar to the analysis fibrosis, but in different proportions, making it much more gelatinous in consistency. This gel-like elastic substance helps transmit stress and weight from vertebrae to vertebrae. The top and bottom of the disc is coated with a complex structure called an end plate that blends into the intervertebral disc and helps hold it in place within the vertebrae. These discs form what is known as a symphysis joint between the vertebrae that provides for padding, flexibility, and some movement within the spinal column itself. The spaces between the vertebrae by the discs also allow for spinal nerves to exit the spinal cord and the spinal column, which is why a problem with an intervertebral disc can have a significant impact on a person's quality of life. 
Going back to the spinal column itself, the first two vertebrae in the cervical spine are unique in their design and function. As such, they also have unique names. C1 is called the atlas and C2 is called the axis. The atlas has a pair of concave facets upon which the skull's occipital bones sit. This joint, called the atlanto-occipital joint, allows the head to tilt forward and back along with some slight lateral motion as well. The axis has an upward bony protuberance called the odontoid process upon which the atlas sits. This particular joint, referred to as the atlantoaxial joint, is what allows the head to pivot side to side. Combined, these two joints allow the head to pivot, nod, and rotate. As we progress down the vertebral column, we reach the thoracic spine. Attached to each vertebrae of the thoracic spine are the ribs. At the anterior of the ribs is the sternum, or breastbone. The sternum is comprised of the manubrium at the top, the body, and the xiphoid process at the bottom. Superior to the manubrium is the suprasternal or jugular notch. These structures form the rib cage, with the vertebrae posterior and the ribs lateral and anterior. This particular area of the body is called the thorax, or chest. Within the confines and protection of the rib cage lie several of the body's vital organs, such as the heart, lungs, great vessels, airway passages, and diaphragm. While the ribs are directly connected to the thoracic vertebrae, they are not directly connected to the sternum. Rather, the ribs and sternum interface by pieces of cartilage, referred to as costal cartilage, that take the approximate form of the adjacent rib. Counting from the top of the rib cage, the first seven pairs of ribs are called true ribs as each of these ribs is connected to the sternum via its own costal cartilage. Ribs 8, 9, and 10 are called false ribs as they are joined to the sternum through a shared, indirect costal cartilage connection. The area of the anterior body between the inferior costal cartilage at the 10th rib and the superior costal cartilage from the 8th rib at the sternum forms what is known as the costal arch. The floating ribs, ribs 11 and 12, do not connect to the sternum at all, which is why they are called floating. They are connected to the respective thoracic vertebrae posteriorly with no anterior connection to any other bony structure. The area in between the ribs is called intercostal space. Each space is numbered with the rib superior to the space. Thus, the space between the first and second ribs is referred to as the first intercostal space. Within these spaces are intercostal muscles that aid in breathing, along with a neurovascular bundle of an artery, vein, and nerve that run along the bottom of each rib. As already mentioned briefly, the rib cage provides for the physical protection of vital organs from external forces and trauma. The intercostal muscles are also considered to be accessory muscles of breathing. Several bones in the thorax or chest are not considered to be a part of the rib cage, yet they attach to the rib cage and extend out to the upper extremities as part of the appendicular skeleton. On the anterior, attached to the manubrium of the sternum by ligaments, is a pair of clavicles, or clavicle referring to one on either the left or right side of the body. The clavicle is a slender, S-shaped bone that helps the shoulder maintain its structure and position. Unfortunately, given the way it is exposed at the top of the thorax, along with its lack of significant girth, the clavicle can be somewhat easy to injure or break. On the posterior, connected to the rib cage by muscles, sits a pair of triangular ship scapulae, or scapula, referring to one on either the left or right side of the body. The lateral aspect of each clavicle meets the laterally located acromium of the scapula to form the acromioclavicular joint. Together, these two bones form the pectoral, or shoulder girdle, which is subsequently attached to the bones of the arm. The superior bone of the arm is the humerus, which connects to the pectoral girdle at the glenohumeral or shoulder joint. The head or proximal portion of the humerus has a spherical shape which, when combined with the scapula and clavicle, form a ball and socket joint that provides for significant freedom of movement, which is what allows for a significant degree of motion and articulation in the upper extremities. 
the distal end of the humerus meets the proximal end of the bones of the forearm to form a hinged elbow joint. The two bones of the forearm are the radius and ulna. The radius is a bone that is directly in line with the thumb, while the ulna is in line with the pinky finger. When standing in anatomical position, the radius is lateral and the ulna is medial. The unique pairing and orientation of these two bones allows for them to twist around each other to a certain extent, providing for the rotation of the hand. Rotating the palm of the hand upward is supination, and rotating the palm of the hand downward is pronation. The distal end of the ulna articulates to the radius. The distal end of the radius is connected to and articulates with the irregularly shaped carpal bones of the wrist. The wrist contains two rows of bones with four bones in each row. While these bones are collectively referred to as carpal bones, each bone is uniquely named. As denoted on the diagram, the names of these bones are scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, hamate, capitate, trapezoid, and trapezium. These carpal bones are prone to injury when a person falls and attempts to stop himself or herself with an outreached hand. Extending distally from the carpal bones are the metacarpal bones. These are the bones of the hand itself and, while they are relatively small in comparison to the humerus, radius, and ulna, are still considered to be long bones given their structure with a wide proximal base, a shaft, and a distal head. Each individual bone is identified by number starting from the radius, or the thumb, and moving toward the ulna, or pinky finger. The metacarpals then connect to the phalanges, which are the bones of the individual fingers. With the exception of the thumb, each finger consists of three phalanges, the proximal, the middle, and the distal phalange. The thumb only has two phalanges, a proximal and a distal phalange. Returning back to the core of the body, if we progress inferiorly down the spinal cord, one will eventually encounter the bones of the pelvis. The pelvis is a ring of bones that consists of the sacrum, coccyx, ilium, ischium, and the pubis bones. The pelvis provides not only support for the trunk of the body and everything above it, but it also provides protection for the organs located within the pelvic cavity, including the intestines, urinary bladder, and female reproductive organs. Unlike the structures of the shoulder, which provide for great freedom of movement and articulation, the bones of the pelvis are relatively immobile and provide a strong foundation for the rest of the body. The structure, referred to as the hip bone, or coaxial bone, consists of three separate bones that fuse together during adolescence. The ilium is the superior bone that is large and fan-shaped in appearance. It is connected to the sacrum at the sacroiliac joint. The superior part of the ilium is called the iliac crest. Located to the posterior, inferior to the ilium, is the ischium. The ischium is the part of the hip bone upon which the body rests when sitting. It is located to the posterior, inferior to the ilium. Lastly, the pubis forms the anterior portion of the hip bone. The pubis on each side of the body curves medially and connects to the other pubis at the cartilaginous joint known as the pubic symphysis. The joint does provide some very limited movement in adults of approximately 2 mm and 1 degree of rotation. This flexibility, if you want to call it that, will increase for women during childbirth. The acetabellum, or cotyloid cavity, is a concave surface of the hip bone that accepts the femoral head of the upper leg, or femur, to form a ball and socket joint that allows for the movement of the legs. The bones of the legs are not too unlike the bones of the arm in terms of orientation to each other. The superior bone of the leg, which connects to the pelvic girdle at the hip joint, is the femur. The femur is the longest and one of the strongest bones in the body, and it serves as the skeletal structural component of the upper leg or thigh. Beginning superiorly toward the top, the femoral head, which sits in the acetabellum of the pelvis, is spherical in shape and forms the ball portion of the ball and socket joint, that is, the hip joint. The head of the femur extends into the femoral neck and the intertrochanteric region of the femur which consists of the greater trochanter, which is considered to be part of the hip, the intertrochanteric crest, 
and the lesser trochanter. These structures serve as connection points for muscles responsible for articulating the leg. When a person, especially an elderly person, suffers a broken hip, it is often the femoral neck that is the site of the fracture. The femur continues inferiorly through the femoral shaft to the distal end where the medial and lateral chondrites provide the joint surface for connection to the tibia or shin bone. The patella or kneecap is on the anterior surface of the knee joint and articulates with the femur. Given the stresses that are placed upon the legs and the knee joint in particular, this joint contains ligaments, tendons, cartilage, and fluid-filled bursae to provide stability and shock absorption when moving. The lower leg consists of two bones. The main bone of the lower leg that forms the knee joint with the femur is the tibia. The tibia is the main weight-bearing bone of the lower leg and as a result it is both longer and thicker than the other long bone of the lower leg, the fibula, which provides stability to the ankle and supports lower leg muscles. An important landmark of the tibia for an EMS provider is a tibial tuberosity. This area is an elevation of the proximal anterior aspect of the tibia just below the anterior surfaces of the lateral and medial tibial condyles. Some refer to it as the bony thickness of the tibia at that anterior point below the knee joint. It is at the medial flat side of the tibia at the same level as the tibial tuberosity where intraosseous access can be obtained. The tibia is more anterior and medial than the fibula, which also means it is more prone to trauma. At the distal end of the tibia is the medial malleus. At the distal end of the fibula is the lateral malleus. These two structures form the medial and lateral wall of the ankle joint. Similar to the wrist and hand, the ankle and foot are comprised of several bones. The tarsus is comprised of several bones that form the hind foot and midfoot. The talus bone is the one that connects to the tibia and fibula to create the ankle joint that allows for movement and pivoting of the foot. Inferior and lateral to the talus is the calcaneus, which is the bone of the heel. If a person falls from a height and lands on his or her heels, it is a calcaneus which is often injured. Together, the talus and calcaneus bones are considered to be the hind foot. The midfoot consists of the navicular bone which is attached to the talus, the cuboid on the lateral arch of the foot, and the medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiform bones. The metatarsal bones extend from the midfoot and meet the phalanges at the ball of the foot. Each toe, with the exception of the big toe, has three phalanges. The big toe has two phalanges. The metatarsals and phalanges are numbered 1 through 5 starting medially along the metatarsals and phalanges of the big toe to the lateral metatarsal and phalanges of the little or pinky toe. The phalanges themselves are identified as being either proximal, closest to the foot, intermediate in the middle, or distal at the end of the toe. Ultimately, the bones in the skeletal system, while important, would be of little utility if there is no way for the body to move. The bones themselves are rigid and immovable. Motion occurs in the joints where bones meet. In addition to facilitating motion, the joints are also involved in proprioception, the awareness of motion, and the positioning or location of body parts. Joints can be complex structures consisting of bones, connective tissue, and other supportive tissue. Depending upon the type of joint, different types and degrees of motion are allowed. In naming or classifying joints, it is often common to look at the underlying function of the joint to determine the type and degree of movement allowed. On one end of the spectrum are joints that are immovable. These joints are called synarthrosis joints. The purpose of these joints is to ensure a strong connection between adjacent bones, typically to ensure the protection of underlying organs. The bones of the skull are joined by fibrous synarthrosis joints. The cartilaginous manubral sternal joint is another example of an immovable synarthrosis joint. Slightly movable joints are called amphiarthrosis joints. Common examples include the joints of the spinal column where each vertebrae is joined to the next by an intervertebral disc or the pubic symphysis in the anterior pelvis. 
While the individual joints of the spine provide for rather limited motion, the cumulative effect of all the joints along the spinal column actually provide for some significant mobility. Lastly, we have freely movable joints referred to as diathrosis joints, which includes all of the synovial joints in the body. Synovial joints are the most common type of joint in the body, and their pronounced structural feature or characteristic is the presence of a joint cavity. Each bone in a synovial joint is covered with smooth articular cartilage, which reduces friction between the bones and allows them to move smoothly against each other. The ends of the two connecting bones are encapsulated within a joint or articular capsule, which encloses a joint cavity. Fibrous connective tissue attaches to each bone just outside the area of the bone's articulating surface, forming the exterior portion of the joint capsule. The interior of the capsule is lined with a thin synovial membrane that contains cells that excrete synovial fluid, a thick, slimy fluid that provides lubrication to reduce friction between the bones of the joint, similar to oil in a car engine, while also providing for the nourishment to the articular cartilage, which does not have its own blood supply, and the removal of waste products, microorganisms, and other debris within the joint capsule. Some synovial joints also have other structures to aid in motion and longevity of the joint. The knee, for example, has a fibrocartilage C-shaped meniscus between the articulating bones to provide for shock absorption and cushioning between the bones. In other joints, a similar yet smaller fibrocartilage articulator disc may be present, assisting in joining the bones of the joint, such as those within the sternoclavicular joint or between the distal ends of the radius and ulna in the arm. Supportive structures outside the joint cavity include a bursa, which is a thin connective tissue sac filled with lubricating liquid. Bursae are often located in areas where skin, ligaments, muscles, or muscle tendons can rub against each other. Classified by their location, subcutaneous bursae are located between the skin and underlying bone. Submuscular bursae are found between a muscle and an underlying bone or between adjacent muscles, and subtendinous bursa can be found between tendons and bone. If you have ever heard of bursitis, that is the inflammation of one or more bursae, commonly in the shoulder, elbow, or hip, that can cause sniffness, aches, pain, or swelling. Movable joints are often identified by the type of motion permitted by the specific structure of the joint. Gliding or plane joints occur where the adjacent bones are relatively flat and movement is limited to a two-dimensional gliding motion across the bones. These particular joints are usually small in comparison to others and can be found in the wrists, ankles, second through seventh sternocostal joints, and vertebral transverse and spinous processes. A hinge joint permits motion in one plane and can be found in the fingers, toes, and elbows. The knee and ankle are often referred to as hinge joints as well, even though those joints also allow for a slight degree of rotation. Pivot joints allow for rotary motion around a single axis. Examples include the proximal and distal radial ulnar joints, along with the atlantoaxial joint between the axis and atlas in the cervical spine. In contrast to the other joints mentioned thus far, a ball and socket joint provides for significant range of motion around multiple axes simultaneously. The shoulder and hip joints are examples of ball and socket joints. A saddle joint is named not unlike a saddle for a horse. One surface is convex and the other surface of the joint is concave, allowing one bone to effectively straddle the other. These joints allow for movement in two planes to support flexion extension, the increase or decrease of the angle of a joint, and abduction adduction, the movement of an appendage either away from or toward the midline. Bending your arm at the elbow is an example of flexion extension while spreading out your toes or fingers like a pianist stretching to push two distant keys at the same time is related to abduction and adduction. Being able to perform both movements at the same time is the hallmark of a saddle joint. The most common example is a trapezio-metacarpal joint at the base of the thumb. 
The sternoclavicular joint, where the clavicle meets the manubrium, is another example that is responsible for giving you the ability to raise your arm over your head. The other common example is the acutomalleal joint within your inner ear between the malleus and incus, which is integral in transferring vibrations in the ear to other structures that facilitate hearing. Lastly, a symphysis joint is a fibrocartilaginous joint where two bones are essentially fused together with little to no motion possible at the seam or joint. In totality, there are 230 joints in the human body, and they can all be described or classified into one or several of the categories we just discussed over this and the last few slides. That concludes this module on the skeletal system. You should now be able to describe the anatomy and physiology of the skeletal system. This presentation was prepared by Waukesha County Technical College in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, and is distributed with an attribution non-commercial share-alike 4.0 International Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021, Waukesha County Technical College. For information on WCTC's numerous fire and EMS educational offerings, please visit us online at wctc.edu.